And I get the great honor of introducing my good friend, William Kinsolving. Uh, William and his wife Susan and Mark and I have been friends since our days at Hotchkiss School when I was a librarian for two years. And uh, William and I worked with the library staff on a reading, a public reading of Under the Lentil. If you ever have a chance to read, it's a play about a librarian who's searching for a book that was put into the book slot that was 100 years overdue. <laughs> and he wanted to find where this book had been that caused it to be 100 years. William is an actor, he's a singer, he's a, a playwright, he's a writer, um, and he has given me an opening that it gives you a sense of his incredible humor as well as his background. And I'll read it if you don't mind. After a questionable academic career at Stanford, in parens, I mean, how practical is it to double major in drama and Far Eastern theology? <laughs> Kinsolving fled to the Oregon Shakespeare Fle Festival to play Richard II. He then attended the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. Returning to New York, he appeared as an actor under, off, and on Broadway, as well as indulging himself as a salon singer in ultra Greenwich Village nightclubs. Going west, as young men are supposed to do, he won the Best Actor of the Year Award from San Francisco Chronicle for a performance at Berkeley Repertoire. Transitioning to a second career, Kinsolving wrote his first play. It was awarded a Ford Foundation Playwriting Grant, and the play was produced by the Stratford Shakespeare's Festival in Canada. This led him into a vis vicious maws of Hollywood, I don't even know how to pronounce that, writing and doctoring some filthy screenplays and having five novels published. Subsequently, he returned to playwriting, of which you will see one example tonight. Walt Whitman, William Kinsel. Thank you. Dear Barbara, thank you very much. The line in that uh, is, he then went to Hollywood and wrote 50 screenplays, <laughs> not filthy screenplays. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I'll be the judge of that. I am so very, very honored to be at this great library. Thank you for letting me do this. This is my pleasure. Walt Whitman, even if this was a full production, uh, there would be no set. This is it. There'd be a lectern on one side of the stage. There'd be a bent cane rocking chair wherever the actor wanted to put it. Walt Whitman, at 67, appears with cane and leather haversack his surprisingly pink face, absolutely inundated with long white beard, long white hair. And aside from this hirsute visage, he shows little sign of age, except that his nose runs on occasion, uh, for which he has a colorful handkerchief <laughs> at the ready. He's clean, but rumpled in an overcoat, a suit of homespun, open shirt, high leather shoes, and a wide-brimmed hat called a wide awake, tilted rakishly on his head. He places papers and copy of his book on the lectern, and if anyone should applaud, he acknowledges it with enthusiasm and then begins the play. Howdy! So glad you could come tonight Oh, what a grand crowd for this celebration. You know, in years past, at my birthday entrance, my celebrators, usually in a tavern or parlor, have been known to burst out singing, for he's a jolly good fellow. <laughs> well, 
Uh, it's a lovely gesture, but deeply frustrating as I, the object of the song, can't join in with appear, without appearing reflexively vain. <laughs> of course, vanity is not always a pejorative. As a matter of fact, I regard it, if justified, as a most beguiling quality. <laughs> and as my book, it, my book will tell you that. I, I don't hesitate to sing any song of myself. I dote on myself. There is that lot of me, and also luscious. <laughs> I say that in the book. Have any of you read it? <laughs> Leaves of grass, not just borrowed it, or even purchased it, bless you for that, but actually read it. We all know about saying we've read some great tome, don't we? And seeing no one else has read it, we can then talk about it in oracularly fashion, and as if the book is our constant companion. Well, if you haven't read the book, your secret is safe with me. <clears throat> but you must. And fortunately, a friend outside uh, awaits you with copies for sale. <laughs> However, I do stray from my purpose. I'll avoid vanity tonight. And let me tell you why. In recent years, as the date of my birth approached, Instead of my usual exhilaration, I've experienced a disagreeable dolefulness. Now, one reason is that when the birthday bell's clapper strikes, the reverberations of mortality sound mm, louder in a deeper, more desolate key. And then, while tolerating this dissonant celebratory mood, I keep being asked to hold forth on venerating the event that all know I regard as history's pivot, the shattering yet mystically glorious death of Abraham Lincoln. And it's caught on. I, I've already done my Lincoln lecture twice this year and have two more engagements left to go. He and I shared a time, a war of secession, an experience of America, as you will hear. So let's start by getting this poem out of the way that I wrote about Lincoln's death. I've written others about it, better ones, but this one's maddeningly demanded. The only one of the mind that's made all of the anthologies, all but one. This poem is no doubt adored because of all the sing-song lyrics, the dum de dum de dum metrics, those repressive, foreign manacles of poetry that I've so constantly rejected, but that wedged themselves back in and made this one so damnably accessible. Oh, captain, my captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near. The bells I hear. The people all exulting. While follow eyes the steady keel. The vessel grim and daring but heart. Heart, heart, oh, the bleeding drops of red where on the deck my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. Oh, captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag is flung, for you the bugle trills. For you, bouquets and ribbon wreaths. For you, the shores in crowding. For you, they call the swaying mass, their eager faces turning. Here, Captain, dear father, this arm beneath your head. 
It is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse, no will. <coughs> the ship is anchored, safe and sound. Its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object won. Exult, O oh shores, and ring, O oh bells. But I, with mournful tread, walk the deck. My captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. Yes, well, even with the dum de dum de dum the poem had emotional and immediate reasons for being, as you will hear. But now, this year, this lovely day of 1886, I celebrate 67 years of living in an era as filled for me with joy and love and all my plunging immersions into life as any I could hope to have. My, my reason for choosing this larger venue, well, I've had some urgent indications, both from my aforementioned mood, but also from nature, that my life could end at any moment. Now, I recognize these signs, I accept them, I confront them. Oh, and by the by, I refuse to believe that they come to me tinged with any divine focus. I believe in every God that the human mind has been capable of creating, and not one is concerned with my death. I am not guilty of that greatest human conceit that whichever God you choose to be your own is therefore exclusively obligated to reciprocate your interest. I'll deal with death, as with everything else in my life, by embracing it, knowing it close, feeling every inch of it, making it my lover. Be assured, I'll try to do all in my power not to have that happen tonight. Uh, although, wouldn't that be an electrifying drama? <laughs> It was nature that galvanized me to bring about this, our vital meeting. One's God is chosen and tortuously encrusted with one's hopes. But nature, ever emanating in infinite variety, simply cannot be refused. Last August, in my adopted town of Camden, New Jersey, a cyclone tore through close to my house on Mickle Street. I'd bought it barely a year before, the only house I've ever owned. The sky went suddenly black and, and the whirling force of the twistering wind, some called it a, a, a tornado, it cut a path through buildings right nearby and left them torn and battered down on top of those unfortunate to have been trapped inside. And if that weren't enough of nature's alarums, a giant blinding fireball tore overhead in winds, roaring winds that blew the clouds to shreds, giving way to sickly light, sifting through thick dust and cries of the survivors. I could hear them, I cowering in terror and confusion in my rocking chair, unable even to use my stick to move. <laughs> even if, if some safety even existed, had the phenomena chosen Mickle Street and thus, in the instant, snuffed out my possibility of responding to such a warning of mortality. In an instant, that wild wind and fire shocked me into seeing that my dedication to my book's revelation had fallen into the languid 
torpor of petty fame. In spite of all my endless, exhausting efforts to seize the public by its unwilling throat, I had fluffed it. My book, that is as much me as what you see standing here before you. A book that is still about the people themselves. Still relevant about America's crises. I was allowing it to slip away without reaching you. Without cramming every American life with the gluts of truth revealed that allow your very survival. In spite of my ever-expanding editions of the book thus far, in spite of my recent lame, pathetic myth, in spite of the book being banned in Boston, <laughs> it hasn't reached you, my fellow life dwellers, with how I came to embrace and penetrate you and the nation, and how I want you and the nation to embrace and penetrate me. I sang it loud in Leaves of Grass back in 1855, the first edition. You've read it. You remember the last line in the preface. The proof of a poet is that his country absorbs him as affectionately as he absorbs it. You remember, of course you do, if not a friend outside has copies. <laughs> now, after nature's clear goading that day, I instantly determined yet again to compel that national affection. My Lincoln lecture was my exemplar. I set forth to arrange for this more public birthday discourse, one that henceforth I will give to any gathering until I drop, whether on my birthday, May 31st, or no. And as this is ever my birthday, I am ever resolved as much for me as for you to reveal, to remember, to reevaluate with you certain incidences in my life that I suspect may be the cause of that relentless public resistance. If you'll allow, we'll move backwards in time cuts, back to the very creation of my book as I do incessantly in the dark hours. To this purpose, I hereby reject the luxury of the cowardly alibi of age. Oh, but it's too late to reassess. Accept what is. Never will I. My purpose is still palpable. Hmm. I feel that once again leaves of grass has been set aside. You must reconsider it. I must examine tonight with you why I haven't reached you to convince you that all is one, that you're ignoring the rudimentary truth of cosmic unity that my book describes will result in the destruction of the all. Therefore prepare dearest and beloved public to have your throat seized. <laughs> the first time cut. Starting in the most recent past, when death's flirtation had its sensate way with me, I'd been living in Washington for eight years following the war. The mortal threat came without any warning without reason, uh, unless, of course, you are of that creeping Calvinistic persuasion that at a certain age, one must meekly accept the plundering by time of our magnificent battlefield bodies that we haul along while stumbling through our lives. I refuse such aging, aging, arguing, arguing, nothing but one's God 
is greater than oneself is. Therefore, as always, I greet each new day as another miracle of possibility to allow a waking worry of some impending bodily malfunction hangnail to the plague, it would blot the sun. And so it came, in an instant, a paralytic stroke, as the doctors called it. I was 54. At first, it left me with only my right half, the other side dead to me. I was taken from Washington to Camden, there to be cared for by my brother George and his dear, dear wife, Louisa, who'd already taken in my poor mother and then me. I remained with them for 11 years. At first fighting simply to stay alive and then fighting to get my body back. A rich selection of agonies was like the changes of my garments. It was a dark, dark period in my life. My beloved mother died. I had another stroke on the other side, presumably to balance me out. <laughs> and during that time of torment, America's endlessly reigning literary deity, Ralph Waldo Emerson, whom I had known and once called master. He published an enormous anthology of 700 of his favorite poems that didn't include a single one of mine. And then the whole nation crashed into a financial panic that lasted and right up to the centennial in 1876. But you see, the unifying truth of our young nation's experiment in democracy, it overcame all that, as did I. Through bloody wars, financial crises, political insanities, even painful literary slights, America had survived and triumphed over an entire century. <clears throat> A national determination to celebrate began to surge. Philadelphia, our cradle of liberty, right across the river from Camden, it decided to announce a world exposition of our great accomplishments. I made it known that I would be delighted to take part. And in an instant, I was invited not to do so. <laughs> but they didn't stand a chance of quashing my still incendiary passion. By then, I had crawled forth and forced my body to obey me in order to allow my unmitigated effervescence. And so tell me, what does a resurrected poet do, one ever driven by his prophetic purpose? Of course, I prepared a new seventh edition of the Leaves of Grass, the Centennial Edition. And it sold <laughs> by the thousands to the swarming public at the exposition. And for a time, royalties actually began to tide in. And soon I was able to buy my haven on Mickle Street. Sales dropped off as they always do. But I had grown complacent, so pleased with my gratifying public, public adulation, with visits from the famous coagulating around, Oscar Wilde came by. Oh my God, what an extraordinary young man. <laughs> but in that comfort of conceit, my innards consuming determination to prevent my book's sad fate of being once again ignored went dormant. My duty to the poems, to the book, to myself languished. 
I'm here tonight with you to overwhelm that degradation. And so continuing our backward leaping appraisal, I now give you the next time cut, those eight distended years before the stroke that I went, uh, that I spent in Reconstruction Washington. When the war ended, I was 46, still a volunteer in the hospitals, being paid as a clerk in the Interior Department. But within one month, I was summarily fired. Hmm. The new secretary, one James Harlan, was a postulating puritanical prig from Iowa. <laughs> he blew in with the post-assassination Johnson administration. Harlan had heard of Leaves of Grass. Not read it. Heard of Leaves of Grass. Who knows if he'd ever read it. His righteous nose in air. He fired 60 women who'd served the department so nobly all through the war. His reason was that they were inappropriate temptations in the workplace. And then, of course, he fired me for disregarding the rules of decorum prescribed by a Christian civilization. Hmm. Apparently, Harlan wished to protect the nation's interiors from the orgiastic images that I and those 60 women spawned in his flatulent mind. <laughs> Fortunately, the uh, attorney general had no such literary scruples, and he hired me at the Justice Department the same day. <laughs> so right here and now, right here, now, in peevish Secretary Harlan's dishonor, uh, he has since lost three elections when he went back to Iowa. <laughs> Let us clarify the sexual content of my work that has caused so much bother for the self-proclaimed virtuous and get it out of the way. They say that every war ends a world. Certainly the war of secession ended the one that I'd inhabited in the early 1850s, during which I created Leaves of Grass, as you will hear. In that turbulent antebellum time, I wrote about the human body as honestly and truthfully, as I wrote about pioneers, crowds, trees, or anything else American. It was an urgent moment to do so, to reveal all of our pure and eternal bodily passions that flowed in their sticky, sweet, torrential currents below the inflexible surface of social repressions that had petrified above. The times demanded a new embracing view of sex that included all of our recent discoveries about physiological science, art, and the civil entitlements of women. Indeed, was not every man and woman alive praying that human sexual passion be put in the demean of poetry and sanity? as something not gross or impure, but entirely consistent with the highest criterions of manhood and womanhood, and indispensable to both? Yes, I knew it had to be done, and that no one else would do it. So I wrote it. Oh, and the I, the me, in what follows. It's not me, not the I. The I as our, as the element of sex in our cohesive American character. A woman waits for me. She contains all. Nothing is lacking. <clears throat> Yet all were lacking if sex were lacking. 
or if the moisture of the right man were lacking. Without shame, the man I like knows and avows the deliciousness of his sex. Without shame, the woman I like knows and avows hers. Now I will dismiss myself from impassive women. I will go stay with her who waits for me and with those women that are warm-blooded and sufficient for me. I see that they understand me and do not deny me. I see they are worthy of me. I will be robust and husband to those women. They are not one jot less than I. They are tanned in the face by shining suns and blowing winds. Their flesh has the old divine suppleness and strength. They know how to swim, row, ride, wrestle, shoot, run, strike, retreat, advance, resist, defend themselves. They are ultimate in their own right. They are calm, clear, well possessed of themselves. Oh, I draw you close to me, you women. I cannot let you go. I would do you good. I am for you and you are for me, not only for our own sake, but for others' sakes. Enveloped in you sleep greater heroes and bards. They refuse to awake at the, uh, any other touch but the man of me. It is you, you women, I make my way. I am stern, acrid, large, indissuadable, but I love you. I do not hurt you any more than is necessary for you. I pour the stuff to start sons and daughters fit for these states. I press with slow, rude muscle, I brace myself effectually. I listen to no entreaties. I dare not withdraw till I deposit what has so long accumulated within me. It seems to me that every man who turns uh, in his birthday should get up and shout that poem at the top of his lungs. <laughs> But even accepting all that I've said, and which of course you do by now, the conventional prurient treatment of sex by our religious worthies, our social dominators, our political vulgarians, still clearly constructs the great barrier to women's social and political equality. Consider this, they say, that one result of our war, our war killed 600,000. One result of that was a constitutional amendment that gave the freed black man the vote, at least a symbol of his humanity, if not providing for his equality. But at that time of national retuning, did another obvious amendment even strike a minor chord on the floor of the Congress that women, human beings, the last I heard, be granted that basic democratic right to vote? Ha! Search for a woman's place in our American Constitution. It is not there. She is still not there. Too often, she is looked on as mere chattel to be negotiated into a marriage that is virtual enslavement instead of what it should be, a meeting of equals based on true passion and mutual respect. And what of nature's similar love and passion between two people who happen to be of the same sex. Why is there human, natural love and passion 
forbidden and condemned by the righteous. Those attracted to the opposite sex do not have the exclusive patent, the holy monopoly on the physical expression of love. In the history of human consciousness, when was such a limitation of normal affection first imposed? The Babylonians? <laughs> Hardly. The Egyptians? They worshipped incest. The Greeks? The Romans? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I deeply suspect religion is to blame that one sect or another was and is responsible. Sexual suppression has such a sanctifying satisfaction to those in need of sacred certainties. This, this sex with one of the same, it also seems to be of irresistible interest to those critics who condemned me. They seize upon my lines of honest, true, and utterly natural passion between those of the same sex and with exquisite and surgical skill. Circumcise them from my context. It's like shooting, going into the Sistine Chapel with a rifle and shooting little holes in the ceiling to excise the genitalia. <laughs> These scuttling, censorious critics seem so ecstatic with their revelations of my filth. But please know this, the filth is created in their flaccid, fetid minds, not in mine, created in their shriveled, vapid circumstances, in the mephitic, pathetic air they breathe, not in mine, in my healthy, pure and magnificent creative passion, all human love possible, divinely created as I have observed it in the unifying human totality and experienced it in myriad embraces in America. Listen. Through me, forbidden voices, Voices of sexes and lusts, voices veiled, and I remove the veil. Voices indecent, by me clarified and transfigured. I do not press my fingers across my mouth. I keep as delicate around the bowels as around the head and the heart. Copulation is no more rank to me than death is. I believe in the flesh and the appetites. Seeing, hearing, feeling are miracles, and each part of me is a miracle. Those selections are from Song of Myself, the first long poem in Leaves of Grass. If, inter inter if you're interested in, in further study about these truthful, utterly natural sexual matters, uh, the book Outside <laughs> for Sale. Those eight years in Washington after the war, I subsisted on the meager government wage of $1,200 a year. I was trying to accomplish two things. The first, continuing my work in the hospitals to help the quickly forgotten wounded of the war get home. And then continuing my thrashing and flogging and wallowing with two more editions of Leaves of Grass, neither of which found life beyond my dithyrambic efforts to give it. This in spite of several champions who came forth with encomiums and volumes of my work that floated desperately in the dank puddles of the public's bottomless indifference. <laughs> For instance, in England, a volume titled The Poems of Walt Whitman caused a great splash across the ocean but alas, only a bare ripple reached here. 
It was not, it was not really leaves of grass. It was slashingly expurgated. Song of Myself was one of the butcher cuts made to satisfy the smothering morality blanketing Britain by the very proper and increasingly dour Queen Victoria. I've always believed that the dirtiest books were the expurgated books. But by then, I was so eager or desperate that my work, whatever was allowed at least be read, yet every word cut was my own flesh. I hated it. And my weakness in allowing it has roared through my sleep ever since, even though I received from that scepter dial, uh, no matter who was carrying the scepter, a few tremendous, big, favorable reviews. And on such febrile and fertile seeds of praise, can whole forests of confidence grow strong and tall with time. Ah, but time, pity please my soul, there's never enough to do what must be done. Yes, 600,000 died in the war. But 400,000 were left alive to rot from wounds and disease. So many caught in the molting bureaucracies of the 40 hospitals I'd worked in since coming to Washington. The earth was already too full to absorb them. My brightest nightmare was how many wounded died before returning home. I couldn't do enough. I packed off as many as I could, tearing free of some I'd loved when we battled for life together through their months of pain from the mini bullets, decay, and amputation. They went back to a world that knew not what to do with them, they being less than whole. When they wrote to me, their lonely dying had begun in the eyes of averting nation that, had, that they had sacrificed their lives to preserve. There is America's shame. I managed a slim selection of short blasted war poems called drum taps. They and the war were one. But even for them, the malicious critics swarmed like feral cats. One of them, a privileged kitten, recently at Harvard. It was named Henry James. He mewed to become adopted as a national poet. It is not enough to discharge the undigested contents of your blotting book into the lap of the public. How pleased he must have been with his puking metaphor. <laughs> I've heard recently he started writing turgid society novels. How, how very appropriate. It became another harrowing, drifting time for me, which isn't time to use, but rather to survive. The mind does its damage. The welling up of uncertainty gives flower to deep-rooted doubt. In my case, suspicions that the war, like some sterilizing storm, had flush flooded away the corruptions, the corrosions, the cons in America that I had seized on and been driven to remedy with my book. Indeed, I believed I was anointed to be the nation's redeeming bard whose poetry would save the nation from its corruptions. But after Lincoln, the martyred savior of the Union, what need was there for my fictive eye, that too proud authoritarian amalgam of me with America, and thus, 
I tortured myself and still do. This, this frustration only hardens my conviction that the poems do nothing but present a quixotic ideal that never can be realized that I'm, all I'm doing is wedging myself further down, down into a skewed, petty, fraudulent ambition. Oh, God! Enough. <laughs> down, down I come, like glistering phaeton, wanting the manage of unruly jades. Oh, Peter. Oh, Pete. Thank all the gods for Pete and for Shakespeare for one night. Into all that depressing miasma of gloom and frustration cruised the maddeningly delightful, naughty, sybaritic Peter Doyle running his streetcar between a stop near my third floor walk up on 6th Street and Georgetown, where some of my champions lived. He was Irish the son of a blacksmith in Richmond. Pete had worked in an iron foundry before joining the Confederate Army. A great, big, hearty, full-blooded, everyday, divinely generous working man, a little too fond of the beer now and then. And I suspect of the women, maybe. But for the most part, salt of the earth. I think he saved my sanity if not my life. <laughs> he complained that I was always too clean. I, of course, complained that he was seldom clean enough. We went to the theater, to lectures, uh, walked together in the military roads towards Alexandria almost every day from first meeting, I riding his streetcar at the, at the night in the nimbus floods of the moon to the end of the line and back declaiming Shakespeare to him and his terrified passengers. <laughs> once more into the breach, my friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. Oh, God, I loved Shakespeare from the earliest. I read him early on. I went to every Shakespeare production that came through New York. I memorized the soliloquies and bellowed them all. Oh, and I bellowed. The Italian opera. <clears throat> oh, dolce bacio, languide carezza, mentrio frem. Oh, my God, I love the Italian opera. I'd seen every Italian opera that came to New York because I was reviewing for the Brooklyn Eagle. I saw them all. And I have to tell you, I don't think I could have written Leaves of Grass without the opera. <laughs> well, Pete and I had such fun, which was life preserving to us both. I've loved many, <clears throat> but none as I loved Pete. He's still in Washington. We write each other still the gossip, the news of old friends. It's, it's my birthday lecture, so he must be a part of it all. When the 60s ended, I was still in Washington writing mainly prose about politics. I saw many perversions in a day. My distress was great. I wrote this, we had best look our times and lands searchingly in the face, like a physician diagnosing some deep disease. Never was there perhaps more hollowness at the heart than at present. And here in the United States, genuine belief seems to have left us. The underlying principles of the states are not honestly believed in, nor is humanity itself believed in. The nation that I loved had become a coruscating corruption. And then, 
without warning, my stars realigned. Improbable things began to happen. Of a sudden, an invitation came from the other side of the moon. I was asked to give a reading of my poems at the very grand New York Industrial Exhibition. For a hundred dollars! Ha! Subsequently, I was asked to give the Dartmouth College commencement poem and lecture with an honorarium, all travel paid. Apparently, I'd caught that dangerous infection called respectability. <laughs> At the same time, my brother George, who must also be here tonight, remembered. He moved what was left of our diminishing family to Camden, New Jersey. Now, looking back, I see this pattern of excitements and how they fit together. But as those grand events lined up in festive parade formation, unaware of my impending strokes ambush, my instincts naturally were a boil. With what? What else? My obsessive craving to publish a new edition of Leaves of Grass. <laughs> yes, choose a god and pray for my sanity. <laughs> now let me first tell you in this time cut of my careworn family, so proud of them and sad, and then of the war itself. My brother George was George Washington Whitman. We were a history besotted American family, five generations on the farms of Long Island. Two other brothers were Thomas Jefferson Whitman and Andrew Jackson Whitman. When I was six, we became a Brooklyn family, for better or worse. I ended school at 11, going right into printing, learning the trade, as well as an occasional teaching, then carpentry with my poor father, who eventually worked and drank himself to death, trying to support us, ever trying to build the family a better house, and then losing it to a mortgage. My mother. She held us all together from house to house, the ideal woman, to me the best the world could possibly offer. My older brother, Jesse, went mad and raving to die in an asylum. My dearest sister, Hannah, married a swine and followed hard upon Jesse close into his depression. And desperate Andy, drank his way to an early death. Mary Elizabeth married, moved away, had five children, and barely looked back at us. And of course, there was dear Eddie, a man-child who remained a 10-year-old. It was never less than a struggle. But even so, George signed up the moment Lincoln called for troops after Fort Sumter was attacked in April of 61. At the time, I was continuing my daily crossing on the Brooklyn Ferry to my unemployed occupation of contempt, indulgence, and loafing. Too old at 41 to march. I was looked on with pitying disdain by the army recruiters who at that point regarded the war as soon to be our age's epitome of glory. It'll be over in six weeks and you'll be war heroes for life. They promised that <laughs> with the usual blind military estimation. In spite of my derisive regard for the mad mindlessness of war, patriotism reached down with its emotional tentacles to wrap me in fantasies of victory. 
I even managed to supply a number of recruiting poems. Beat, beat, drums, blow, bugles, blow, through the windows, through the doors, burst like a ruthless force into the solemn church and scatter the congregation into the school where the scholar is studying. Leave not the bridegroom quiet, no, hope, no happiness must he have now with his bride, nor the peaceful farmer, any peace plowing his field or gathering his grain. So fierce you were and pound you drums, so shrill your bugles blow. It goes on like that. It was published in many dailies. And as such bombast goes, it seemed to be very effective to everyone but me. George charged immediately into battle. And soon after, the Tribune on that list of the wounded in one of the bloodiest clashes yet at Fredericksburg, his name appeared. I was ne on the next train to go and try to find him so I could help him. After searching the Washington hospitals, I found him with his regiment at Falmouth, Virginia. His wound at Fredericksburg was a gouge in the cheek, mostly healed. But in my search, I had seen the mutilated legs, the splintered arms stacked outside the surgery tents. I had stared into eyes as they went lifeless. I'd heard phrases begging love be sent that ended in a choked last breath before a loved one's name could be heard. I'd watched men silently wait for help or death, clutching to hold the bleeding parts of themselves together. And there were already tens of thousands. The idea of returning to my self-mirroring, grubbing life became nonsensical. I could do nothing but stay. It was not once more into the breach, but rather that my disdain for the colossal waste of war was subsumed to the dying and suffering it caused. Do not mistake me. I believed in Lincoln's war of secession, the unqualified necessity for the conflict, its purifying convulsiveness towards unifying the nation. Besides that, I wish to pay my small pittance towards the horrendous price that the war was costing. And so I bore witness in the hospitals to unmeddled heroes cowering in the darkest corners of courage. I went twice a day. My bare salary as a government clerk sufficed, my hours being of my choosing as long as my work was done. My meals of brown bread, tea, and fruit were feasts to what was given the patients. I volunteered as a wound dresser the title that was put on my pass to allow my access to the hospitals. And soon I was writing articles for the daily papers about my work, and yes, poems that would be added to my book. I took to stuffing my haversack with small gifts, stationery, to write letters home, candy, fruit, book, books, tobacco. I gathered great bunches of dandelions and red clover and strewed them over the cots. People in Brooklyn and New York responded to my articles and letters, sending donations to help pay the travel costs of those few wounded who wondrously could leave. I'd read to the others. I'd, I'd talk if they wished, sit silently holding a hand, listen for hours to groans. Those dying knew it and knew I'd never leave them. They never, <laughs> my blab can't capture these horrors. I had to write it. On, on I go, open doors of time, open hospital doors, the crushed head I dress, 
poor crazed hand, tear not the bandage away. The neck of the cavalryman with the bullet through and through I examine. Hard the breathing rattles, quite glazed already the eye, yet life struggles hard. Come, sweet death. Be persuaded, O beautiful death. In mercy, come quickly. From the stump of the arm, an amputated hand, I undo the clotted lint, remove the slough, wash off the matter and blood. Back on his pillow, the soldier bends with a curved neck and side falling head. His eyes are closed. His face is pale. He dares not look on the bloody stump and has not yet looked on it. I dress a wound in the side, deep, deep, but a day or two more for this one. For see the frame all wasted and sinking in the yellow blue countenance sea. I dress the perforated shoulder, the foot with the bullet wound, cleanse the one with annoying putrid gangrene, so sickening, so offensive, while the attendant stands behind, aside me, holding the tray and pail. Do not mistake me. The doctors, the nurses did all they could in overworked, diseased, impossible conditions that nothing could assuage but the end of war. Blunt and obdurate proficiency was forced on them, thus creating a void of benevolence that I attempted to fill. But in light of each man's loss of life, limb, mind, I could never do enough. It's been a deep concern as I considered this evening's re-examinations and in preparation. I figured out that I'd made some 600 visits to the hospitals over the war years, visiting between 80 and 100,000 patients. Those numbers, more than any other quotidian achievement, justify, and indeed, they redeem my taking breath. But even so, it wasn't enough. And by the time we heard of Lee and Grant ending it at Appomattox, I was damnably sick myself with what they thought was consumption. That night, I was working at the Armory Square Hospital, which had the hopeless cases, a thousand shattered patients. An adjutant rushed in, bellowing the news with voice-cracking emotion. In response to ceasefire, the end of war, hardly a murmur was heard from those still fighting their unremitting battles with pain and disillusion. He left grumbling in a cloud of indignation. I was quickly given leave to get back to Brooklyn to recover my own health and to my family who were once again deep in their struggles to endure. I was there for just four days until the whole world cracked. John Wilkes Booth's pistol shot was such a pure cowardice, such a, a longing for center stage. Do you know the story? Pete Doyle was in Ford's theater that night. I must confess that I still wonder with whom. He told me all about it. Here's what I say in my other lecture about Lincoln. There was a pistol shot. A muffled sound not one one-hundredth part of the audience heard. And then through the draperied, starred and striped spaceway of President Lincoln's box, a figure rises himself, stands a moment on the railing, leaps below to the stage, catching his boot heel in the copious draperies of an American flag. He falls to one knee, rises as if nothing happened, and so John Wilkes Booth the murderer, dressed in plain black broadcloth, bareheaded with full glossy raven hair, holds aloft in one hand a long knife, 
walks along, not, not much back from the footlights, to center stage, turns fully to the audience, his face lit by basilisk eyes flashing with desperation and insanity, launches out in a steady voice, Sic Semper Tyrannis, and then walks to the back of the stage and disappears. That banal Latin line was believed to have been uttered at Caesar's assassination by Junius Brutus, subsequently a leading Shakespearean role that John Wilkes Booth had not the talent to play. It was also the given name of his father, Junius Brutus Booth, the greatest actor of his age. I'd seen his terrifying Richard III when I was a boy. The father's stunning talent clearly did not pass down to John Wilkes Booth, but to his jealously hated brother, the still eminent Edwin. One wonders who else John Wilkes Booth was killing. But beyond the pathetic executioner, the tragic splendor of Abraham Lincoln's death was a national purging and an illumination of the all. That assassination was one simple, fierce, horrific deed, a resolution of so many bloody and angry problems, the ending of one man's life at the same time of nearly four million slaves emancipation, the unification of a shattered America had begun. As I, and now you know, is exactly what I had set out to do as the great American bard writing leaves of grass it was published for the first time almost exactly a decade before that death. Lincoln and I had shared that time. In dying, he had triumphed. In living, I had failed. Now admitting this so publicly tonight to you, and yes, to myself, I hope reveals my private desolation at my public conceit. Now, a short but vital time cut, diving back into a private abyss of mine, just before the war began, I must address a gossipy public condemnation of my wasteful behavior. N not to excuse it, but to make clear my crucial indulgence from about 1857 up to the war, crucial because if I hadn't allowed those sagging years before the war took hold of me and after the original fiasco of Leaves of Grass, that's what it was, I never would have written another word. America was awash in the chiaroscuro intimations of war, of failing and flailing politics and politicians. President Pierce? President Buchanan? <sighs> Could there ever be worse presidents? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Such venality and shallowness as they displayed are still as possible today in these United States as anywhere else. Our grand constitution is helpless to prevent it. But even so, <coughs> The late 50s hmm, was also a time of florid, moiling, mixing, mingling intercourses of culture, opera, fine art, theater, politics of every persuasion, every extreme, journalism from gutter gossip to philosophy, books from scrotum burning sensationals to soul striking new Bibles of spiritual lightning with intense love and sex was regarded as part of the sumptuous decomposing social tapestry as I've told you, oh yes, and in any combination, oh yes, without consequence, 
or compromise, oh yes, in America, or at least in New York City. <laughs> I was unemployable, fired from newspapers I'd edited, shamed by the utter flop of my first two editions of my book, unread, creatively dead, regarded as uselessly eccentric, living at home, living at home with my family in a meager apartment in Brooklyn and convinced I hadn't another word to write. Where else could I go but to a dank, dark den of iniquity hmm. in a vaulted, smoky ba basement with four gas jets that cast the shadows that we so desperately needed. It had a long table seating 30. This was the comforting dark of Pfaff's Saloon. I always say it with an emphatic PF. Can't be said any other way. <laughs> Pfaff's was deep beneath the streets of New York and it let me be deaf to whatever I didn't wish to hear. Under that corner of Broadway and Bleecker, one could depend on one's self-destructive wallows being accepted there. Such wallows were certainly noted and often skewered for the entertainment of others, but never judged. In those moldering depths of pfaffs, Wine-charged debates on Hegel, on phrenology, and glorious death bloviated through the cigar smoke. When I lurched my way down the steep metal stairs from the sidewalk, I found a wide selection of bizarre, brilliant, broken, besmirched, and beguiling men and women, and in between, or both, I was allowed a place at the table and gave in to the desuetude of Pfaff's bohemian life, enjoying the laughter and the beautiful young specimens drawn down into the lair, listening to the actresses sing or soliloquize, to the writers reading their extrusions, to the humorists puncturing the punctilious and with time, that miracle of fructifying time that Pfaff's exclusively could provide me, I finally began to write poems again. And so one night, I finally read something of what I was to my fellow implausibles. It was to shock my life into momentary being. Oh, baffled, balked, bent to the very earth, oppressed with myself, that I have dared to open my mouth. Aware now that amid all that blab whose echoes recoil upon me, I have not once had the least idea who or what I am, but that before all my arrogant poems the real me stands yet untouched, untold, altogether unreached. Withdrawn far, mocking me with mock congratulatory signs and bows, with peals of distant ironical laughter at every word I have written, pointing its silence to these songs and then to the sand beneath. I perceive I have not really understood any thing. Not a single object, and that no man ever can, because I dared to open my mouth to sing it all. One of the Pfaff's mob sent it off to the Atlantic Monthly as a joke. 
they printed it. <laughs> Within two weeks, a Boston firm offered to publish Leaves of Grass again. I went to Boston to supervise this, the publication. And then Emerson, whom I thought of as my master, my advocate, descended from his conquered citadel to walk me around the Boston Common in order to convince me to cut out everything salacious. I couldn't. I wouldn't. I didn't. I never realized his resentment at my rejecting his majestic advice until many years later. But as I've warned the world, I know perfectly well my own egotism, know my omnivorous words, and cannot say any less. And therefore, the third edition of Leaves of Grass was published whole. 5,000 copies sold with 136 new poems. It received good reviews instantly countered by that ineluctable Boston reaction of sexual matters and banning, as Emerson had prophesied. Uh, well, and in that moment of that specious debate, Lincoln was elected president, the war began, and my publisher went bankrupt, taking my royalties along. And there I was again, wondering what the hell I was doing, how I'd ever dared to be a poet. Yes, such an audacity of vanity. I was adrift until the hospitals found me. Can you stand sinking back down to the final time cut? Do I dare? tell you of the book, the very beginning, the driven madness it took, the frustration that that shambles triggered. Well, of course I dare. You're part of it now. I must here confess an earlier crashing wave over me from Emerson. It was like a baptism of an unsuspecting convert. When I was a journalist back in 1842, he came through New York and gave a lecture. I'd heard him. It was called Nature and the Powers of the Poet. He described America's need for a poet of the modern, one who would, in a meter-making argument, sing of our log rolling, our stumps and the politicians, our fisheries or our Negroes and Indians, our boasts and other repudiations. One decade later, I was that poet, although meterless, and was already writing my book to save the nation. As I said, no one else was confronting those politically rupturing early 50s. Out in Kansas, the flint of war was being struck. America was plummeting towards that chaos. Lincoln, defeated for his seat in Congress after a single term, had withdrawn from politics to practice law. And by the time he reappeared to challenge Stephen Douglas for the Senate, Lincoln lost again. I had accepted my self-selection as America's bard. 1855 was a perfect time to publish, I thought. A presidential election was looming, the political order was collapsing, the failed Whig party joining with the bigoted, violently anti-immigration, know-nothing party. My Democrats shot through with big city corruptions and torn apart north and south by the slavery debate. And this enabled the vibrant brand new party, the Republicans, to coalesce, coalesce around the single principle of opposing slavery's spread in new territories. At their convention, Lincoln ran to be the young party's vice presidential candidate. But he lost, as he had that maddening habit of doing. 
<laughs> but, but, but by the way, by, by the way, he said something during that campaign that I've never forgotten. To test a man's character, give him power. Now that's uh, a difficult gamble, a dangerous risk to take in a presidential context. <laughs> but power does reveal the man, uh, or the fool. I was 36 that year. I'd learned printing as a boy, starting with a bed and platen hand press. No one else was going to publish my poems, and no one knew me as a poet. I'd published the occasional dum de dum de dum poem, but I was a journalist, an editor of New York and Brooklyn newspapers. And what was American poetry at the time? A dribble of rhyme masters. Everyone was clamoring for the likes of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a committed dum de dum de dum imitator of those constricting European forms and rhyme schemes that force so much to be left out. The song of Hiawatha, an American myth in rigidly tro trochaic tetrameter. By the shores of Gitchigumi. Oh my God. <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe once called him a plagiarist, stealing from Alfred Lord Tennyson. Oh, I beg his pardon. He is of Harvard and therefore can do no wrong. Oh, but um, uh, we mustn't leave out John Greenleaf Whittier, a devoted Quaker who writes Quaker hymns with quaking aching rhymes and very few strings to his harp. Let's leave it at that. Ah, but there, there, of course, enthroned in his conquered Olympus was Ralph Waldo Emerson, the god of the transcendentalists. His profound discourse on anything was praised by his worshipers as worthy of inclusion in the New Testament. And he too was of Harvard. Oh, this learning, what a thing it is. He made a comet's arc across my years, so bright, and then burning out in Concord's too rich air. So because of that, poetical pantheon, but more for the nation. I laboriously printed nearly 800 copies of my first edition, 96 pages, with a preface and 12 poems, but I had no means of bringing attention to it. I needed to gain the public's concentration. Being unknown, I therefore wrote myself some absolutely glowing reviews and had them published anonymously. <laughs> what, you cavil at that? Well, they did then too. But who better can tell the public how magnificent the poetry was? Ha! And as confidence swelled, I sent precious copies to, of the aforementioned eminences of poetry, presuming at least a recognition by them of something new, a free form and style distinctly American. Hmm. Then having put myself naked and passionate before the nation, I waited for the nation's reciprocity. <laughs> Have you ever heard the echo of silence? <laughs> it is deafening. The only belch I heard was Whittier, shocked, had thrown the whole thing in the fire. Until out of nowhere, a magic chord was struck. It came in the form of a letter from, in my long smoldering conversion, the shining god of literary judgment, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Oh, listen to this. Dear sir, I am not blind 
to the worth of the wonderful gift of leaves of grass. I find it the most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom that America has yet contributed. I am very happy in reading it as great power makes us happy. I give you joy of your free and brave thought. I find incomparable things said incomparably well as they must be. I greet you at the beginning of a great career. Ralph Waldo Emerson. <laughs> well, what does an unknown poet do with that? He sends it everywhere to be published anywhere. And I immediately set about publishing the second edition of Leaves of Grass <laughs> with 20 new poems and Emerson's letter included with my effulgent response to it, along with those good reviews I wrote as well. And on the cover, etched in gold, I greet you at the beginning of a great career, all of which I did. <laughs> About which the many became so righteously indignant and would not buy the book. A public malfeasance with Emerson's private correspondence, they said. Rude and lacking dignity, they said. Well, I'm memorably rude. I proudly lack dignity. I'm forthright and one of the roofs. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. I skirt the Sierras. My palms cover continents. I am large. I contain multitudes. And those multitudes needed to know of Emerson's letter so that they could learn what I intended for America. And so I waited again for the nation to do its duty. And here I am 30 years after my first great calamity of poetry, waiting still. But now, with you, I'm roused by our time together, by your knowing something of my brawl with life. These clarifications and admissions must draw the public back to the book. I'm once again determined to embrace and penetrate you and the nation and to gain the exaltation of which leaves of grass is worthy. At 67, <sighs> everything is subject to question and doubt. So much the fraying mind leaves out. So much I've left out. But the poems must never be left out. For they live as I live, and even one day when I don't. And now you have the latest 1881 edition. Oh yes, another sense, the centennial, the eighth. 293 poems. Uh, did I mention that there are copies? Of, yeah. <laughs> to know America and me to understand that we are all sublime when we are one with each other in the all. And to understand my delight in your coming here tonight, you must read my book. To have great poets, there must be great audiences too. And tonight, you have triumphed so far. There's one more thing to do. The proof of the poet is that his country absorbs him as affectionately as he absorbs it. I am yours. You must be mine. So long. Oh, oh don't get up. You look so comfortable. Thank you so much.